good at being. Forgive him for what he does against me. 
And they suggested a really big number. And they said, Lord, seven times in a day for the same thing, seven times in a day. You know what the Lord said, right? He said, no, not seven, but 70 times seven in one day. Wait, wait. Lord, how many times should I forgive David for doing the same thing against me over and over and over again? And the Lord says, seven times 70. And that number is not that we would calculate. We see seven times 70 is 490. And we start counting, you know. That's not the, the term seven times 70 was an idiom of speech. And it meant, it meant, uh, Forever, it meant an, an innumerable number of times is is what is how many times you should forgive. And they said, "Well, Lord, uh, Lord, help our uh, help our unbelief," because they didn't you know, they couldn't imagine how they could possibly do that. But actually, in Proverbs twenty four sixteen, the, the writer of Proverbs says. That a just man falls seven times and gets up again. I'm going to talk. I want to talk about three people or three areas that forgiveness needs to reign in our lives. In John three sixteen, we know that verse very well, right? You want to, we can say it together. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever no whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay, the word perish, if you were to look at that word, it, it means, of course, to die, but it also means to de decay, to decline, and to corrupt. It's something that starts bad and gets worse. Okay, every one of us is born a sinner. From the moment we are born a sinner, our, the sinfulness in our lives starts from bad and gets worse. That's the life of an unbeliever. Or that's that's the life of a, of a spiritually blind and dead person. But if you would look at the next verse, it says that God did not send His Son to condemn the world, but, but to save it. That Jesus didn't come to prove God's holiness by proving how bad the world is. He came to prove God's love by dying for that world. So... When Jesus looks at the world, he's not looking at it with condemnation and judgment. Even though our own consciences do look at us that way. And our consciences uh, attack us very often and tell us how sinful we are. I have an, a, a, like a picture in my mind of what, what it's like when we think about sin. Okay. So, now, I'm going to a little example. Okay, has anybody ever been walking through the woods and you run into a cobweb? Right? And you freak out, right? You're like, ah, 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 ah. you want to get the cobweb because you think, oh my gosh, the spider's in my hair or something. Right? It just freaks you out to have a spider web. Or it also, if I were to say, if I were to say to Jessica, oh Justin, you have a you have a bee in your hair, or you have a wasp in your hair. And you know how Justin would, he, you know, ah, 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 and maybe run a little bit to try to get away from it or something. Okay. I'm suggesting <coughs> that this is how we need to be when we have sin in, in our hearts. Right? When sin is near us, when sin is like that, we need to, we need to freak out and run. Remember when Joseph was in Egypt, he was, the Pharaoh's wife liked him. I think Joseph was probably a very good looking young man. He, uh, he was Jewish, so he had probably curly hair, big, dark brown eyes. Uh, and he probably was, was very handsome. And she liked him. And of course, you know, in Egypt in those days, there wasn't a lot of morality going on. And cheating on your husband was probably not a big deal. This is probably not the only man that she slept with besides her husband. But she wanted Joseph. And she seduced him and tried to get him to come to bed with her. And so Joseph, what did he do? Ran. He didn't walk. He didn't like try to explain himself. He ran. He ran to get out of there. Because sin is not something you can play with. If you hang around too long, it gets you. 
So, when sin is in my heart, when temptation is in my heart, I get rid of it as quickly as I can. But if a man sins, and I want to look at one at a good verse here in 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. It doesn't say, it doesn't say that we're not supposed to sin. Because that would be unreasonable and foolish. But instead, he says, I write unto you, in verse 1, 1 John 2, 1, I write unto you, my little children, I write unto you that you sin not. Okay, I don't want you to sin. But, if you sin, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation or the satisfaction of God's righteousness and holiness for our sins. And not for ours only, but the sins of the whole world. Once we have sinned, then we have sin in us. Before we sin, we are tempted to sin on the outside. You know, like temptation comes. If we jump at it, then we have sinned. Now we know that we have done something. Not just a thought about sin, but actually we have done something. A, an evidence, you can bring out the evidence and prove that it happened. Now it is in my heart. And what am I going to do with it when it's in my heart? When my sin is in my heart. And I believe that we should do the same thing with it that we do when the cobweb gets in my face. That I get it out as quickly as possible. That I do not dwell on it. I do not leave it there. I do not let it decay and let it get stinky and rotten. Because, because that process will bring me all the way through to condemnation. And depression and all the things that result from keeping sin in my heart. So the, the, the three things that I want to look at then... It's concerning forgiveness. The word forgiveness means to, to blow away, completely away, or to wipe completely away as if it had never been there. Okay? It means to completely remove as far as the east is from the west. We, uh, we know that song. So as far has God removed my sin from me. So... The first thing that we have to do when we sin is in 1 John 1, 9, it says that if we would sin, we confess it to God, and He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, forgive us of our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The first thing we have to do when sin is in our heart is confess it to God, and God will forgive it. This is true not only of my own sin, but it's true of my brother's sin, or my sister's sin in the Lord, or somebody in the world. Right, that as soon as I find that sin is in me, and if David does something against me, even though I am okay, I am right, he is wrong, he sins against me, there's a sin in my heart. It's his. Right, it's his sin in my heart. I remember it. I can find evidence for it. I can prove it. I can talk to people about it. Uh, but we remember that Proverb 25, 2, it says it, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. Well, God doesn't want us to talk about it. God doesn't want us to keep it. God wants us to get rid of it, to forgive it. It means to take it away out of my heart. And how does that happen? And we do it by confessing it. If we confess, the word confess means to agree with God. If we would agree with God concerning sin, then God takes the guilt, takes all of the effects of that sin away from my heart, and I can live in freedom towards Him. If I hold on to it, I am like a man who was forgiven a million dollars, and I cannot forgive somebody for one dollar. So, Paul said that we would forgive each other in the same way that Christ forgave us. First thing, therefore, is that we are forgiven. Lord, here I am. Do you feel clean or dirty right now? you feel clean or dirty before God right now? And I would say if you feel any sense of impurity, 
Any sense that you are not worthy, any sense of unholiness, or that is, there is dirt, you're a Christian, but there's dirt on you, then you need to go to God and you need to say, Lord, there it is. The dirt, the stuff from the Word. Remember Jesus was with His disciples and He was washing their feet. And Peter said, Lord, don't wash my feet. He said, if I don't wash you, if I don't wash you, then you have no part of me. He said, well, then wash me my whole body. Peter was a bit of an extremist. Then wash my whole body. And Jesus said, you, do, you are already clean, all completely clean, but only your feet are dirty. And their feet are, our feet are where we walk in this world. So Christians can get dirty, and we feel it. You live a couple of days, you never read, you don't read your Bible for the two days, you go to some movie that's so trashy and it like spills mud all over your soul. I've been to those kind of movies, you walk out, you feel like you've been violated. Like, I can't believe I watched this. And you, what are you going to do with that? And when God walks in there, I mean, you go, you watch some film from Hollywood. I just watched Take Two, which is the sequel to Take It, which is some crazy guy who's really good at killing people. And that's what he does the entire movie, just shoot and kill people. You know, but if God were to walk right into the movie theater, there you walk. And you feel like, whoa, this is not good. God's here. Like, what, what do we do with that? And you know what we have to do with it? We have to just confess it. Lord, I, I know I shouldn't be here. I really shouldn't be. It was, a, it was a crazy decision that I came here. And he says, I forgive you. I, he will never not forgive you. How many times a day if you, for doing the same thing? Seven times? No. Seven times 70. Why is that? Because when Christ came, He came not to make us, uh, not to make us not sin. He came so that He could forgive us when we sin. See what I mean? Because you and I are sinners. Have you noticed? We live in a sinful world. Have you noticed? It doesn't mean that we should go out. I don't, I'm not encouraging you to sin. I don't have to encourage you to sin. Because you're going to do it anyway. Whether I encourage you or not. Because the thing that captures our minds, the thing that makes Christianity so appealing, is His love. When He says, I forgive you. Really, Lord, I've done this so many times. You keep forgiving me. I forgive you. I forgive you. And finally we say, Lord, I think you love me. I'm becoming convinced that you really love me. I am so amazed that you still love me. That you haven't said, forget it, I'm going on to another person. You're not made of the right stuff for me. I'm going to go try to save somebody else. <laughs> right? Instead he says, I'm not leaving you. I'm not leaving you. I paid the whole package. I'm not leaving you. I'll walk with you. You're going to take me to some pretty crazy places. But I'm going to go there with you. You're going to show me some things that you're going to be ashamed of. And I was crucified for them. I'm going to walk with you. That's what our Savior is like. So first I need to go to God and become, and become forgiven. And then when my brother sins against me, this is point number two. When my brother sins against me, I need to go to God and for his forgiveness. David did this against me. What do I do with that? It's in my heart. I can see it. I can see him doing it. He's a no good, rotten thief. Should never have taken it. I mean, I, I spent my good money on that. He should never have taken it. It's so wrong. What do I do with that? You go to God, and he takes it away from you. He forgives David the same way he forgave me. He forgives David. And now the next time I see David, now, now love has a decision to make, right? Now David's free, but he took my whatever he took. And now I'm going to go talk to him, David. I have to talk to him. I don't hate him. I'm not, not going to beat him. There's no hatred in my heart or even anger. It's like, David, come on. I'm going to give that thing back. And there's no problem. Just give it back. And if he's, 
says, no, I'm not giving it back. I didn't take it. And the Bible says, I can if I want to. I don't have to. But if I can, I can go with witnesses to him. Take these two. Guys, did you see him? I saw him. I, he was, you know, I saw him. And David's like, there he is. Evidence number one. Evidence number two. Evidence number three. So, come on, give it back. I didn't take it. He's still saying that he didn't take it. I don't have to. I can if I want to, but I don't have to. I could bring him to before the elders of the church, and we could talk about David. Come on, you're in the church, and you're doing that kind of stuff in the church. With witnesses, come on. Come on. It's okay. It's not a big deal, but just, just confess it. But then some people say, but... What if then he does that, that we bring him to the elders and he still denies it? Should I bring him before a judge? Should I bring him before a judge? Answer, no. Well, what about what he took from me? Forget it. Because you don't take a Christian brother in front of an ungodly court. Right? Because it's between us. And in any case, we don't care. Lord... I forgive him. I lost it. I forgive him. He hurt me. I forgive him. This thing happened that was so bad. I forgive him. Now imagine how Hetty was feeling today if it wasn't her backpack that hit that thing, but it was David who hit it. David's getting beat up on today. <laughs> it was David. He just walking by. Boom, boom, crash. And Hetty opens up her cello, and the thing's all snapped and broken. The strings cost $300. I don't even know how much cello is worth God's money. And uh, Hedy's got a different problem. Does she hate David? Because David ruined her life? Where does she go? She's got to go to God. Like her face just got wrapped up in a cobweb. She's got to get rid of it. i got to give it to God. i got to get rid of it. As quickly as I can. Because if I let sin dwell in my heart, it will decay there. It will de produce depression. It will produce sadness, hopelessness, despair, anger, revenge, bitterness. All of those things are, are in our hearts because of sin. But we bring it to God and let it go. Lord, you, you died for it. I let it go. And then I know how to act in love. So that's a brother sins against me. If I've sinned against a brother, what if I have sinned against a brother? I have done something against a brother, and I know that my relationship with him is messed up. I've done something against my brother. The Bible says in, in Matthew 5.23 that before you go and give your offering in the church, you leave it there, and you go get it right with your brother because he has something against you. So let's say I did something I know I did. Now David's out. Hey, man. Uh, I, I know Dave, David's, out, David's out there, and I know he's angering me. I know he did, I did something, but he's not coming to me. But he's out there, and I know, I know that he's got something against me. What do I have to do? Now, I could say, well, you know what? I got a lot of friends, so a lot minus one is not such a big deal for me. I mean, I like David, but... I can live without him. And the guy, you know, I mean, I don't, I, I mean, he's got an attitude against me. He's got a problem with me. I don't even know what his problem is, maybe. I just know that he's got a problem with me. What do I do? What does God want me to do? You know what he wants me to do? Be humble and say, i got to fix that relationship. i got to go to him. Well, I know I'm supposed to go to a brother if my brother sins against me. That was me. Hey, you stole something from me. Yeah, i got to go to him. But now, he didn't steal anything from me. I, he, I did something against him. Maybe I don't even know what it is. But I know he's got a problem. So God says, hey, before you go to church the next time, before you come to me the next time, I want you to go and I want you to fix it. The best you can. Whew. Okay, I'm going. Hey, David. I talk to you for a minute. That takes a lot of courage when you know a guy's got a problem with you. Yeah, sure. 
sure, let's talk. Well, why did you say no? <laughs> that would have been so much easier. Okay, here we go. I call these faith appointments. I'm going to meet and we're going to talk. David. And you know what the first thing you say? David, forgive me. Forgive me. Husbands and wives, see, husbands and wives have this problem. And that is that they keep score of who started it and who didn't. And that's why husbands don't go to their wives and say, please forgive me. Because she screamed at me first. I mean, she had the problem. And then, yeah, I got mad, but it was her fault. So why isn't she coming to me? Well, that's you could do that if you want to do it that way. Just leave the relationship broken. Leave the relationship ruptured. Or you can say, I am guilty. I am the reason this is broken. I don't know what I did, but I know it was me. I know it was my problem. And then the first thing I say to David, David, forgive me. I don't, I don't know what I did, but I, but I honestly, this is a relation that's important to me. Forgive me. You see how powerful those words are? Not, hey, you got a problem with me? You see how not cool those words are? Because what's he going to do? He's going to spew what his problem is. And probably you're going to react and say, what? I didn't do anything like that. Or whatever the argument starts. But if you go like this, David, listen, forgive me. I, I, there's something between us, and I know. I know it's my fault. What weapon does he have against that? He could say, you're darn right it's your fault. <laughs> and I say, I know when you forgive me. Or maybe he thinks, maybe he knows, maybe that he had a problem too. And he says, hey, listen, I know, man, it's completely, it's cool, it's okay. It's okay, but really it was nothing. And we repair our relationship. My relationship with God when sin comes into my life, my relationship with somebody who sins against me, my relationship with someone that I have sinned against, or they think I have. You know, someone who's got a bad attitude against you, it's hard to take responsibility for their bad attitude. Like, you don't even know why. They just don't like you. But you can walk up to them and you can say, hey, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Whatever I did. It happened to me just a little while ago. Uh, it was right before I went to Hungary. I was sitting with this guy who I've been working with lately, and he used to be in our church. And a whole bunch of stuff happened in the church. You know how it can be with churches sometimes. It can get a little bit messy, you know. And so he, I don't know what happened to him. And he doesn't know what happened to me exactly. But we sat down for lunch. And he had tears in his eyes. And he said to me, Brian, I just want to say I'm sorry. If I ever said anything, if I ever thought anything against you, I'm sorry. Oh, my gosh, it melted my heart. Because, I, I mean, I didn't, didn't think he did anything, but he realized that maybe something he thought or something he said could have affected our relationship, and he just wanted to take it out of the way. It was so godly and so awesome when he did The result of this, <clears throat> in James 5.16, it talks about people in the church who are sick, like physically sick, and it could be because of sin. Because of guilt that's in their hearts. That it hasn't been cleansed by the Lord because they haven't confessed it, though he's already died for it. That there's something between people in the church and it's like troubling the heart and the soul. Because if you keep sin, it decays, it declines, it rots, right? It dies. But if you let it go, it produces this life. So James says... Told the, told the people who was, James was actually the Lord's brother. He said, or his half brother actually, same mother, different dad. Uh, this was Joseph's kid. It wasn't nearly as cool as his older brother, but that's the way it is. <laughs> when you happen to be in a family that's got Jesus as the oldest brother in the family, pretty hard to compare yourself. Number two son syndrome must have been horrible. For poor James. Anyway, James wrote, confess your sins one to another. Learn just to confess your sins one to another. There's no, there's no shame 
in being a sinner. We all are. And of course, before God, there is shame, and we sense that shame. But Christ has overcome that. The more important thing is relationship, relationship, relationship with God and with people. And houses are broken. You know, my family, my kids are like adult friends to me. Like, we love each other. Like, it's amazing. My family's amazing, and God did it. And I, somebody said, you should write a book. I had no idea what I would write in that book. Just hold on for dear life and just pray that God will help you. That's how short the book would be. And it may be, I don't know, and yeah, I have kids. Uh, but when I was in Hungary, a guy, a guy, I sent everybody a picture of my family at Christmas. Maybe you've seen it on Facebook or something. And he looked at it and he said he began to cry when he first saw it because my family is so beautiful. His family is broken. His wife committed suicide. His boys, he and his boys are a little bit broken up and disturbed. I don't know what his Christmas was like, but it's not like, it's not like our Christmas. And I think, what could have happened in that home that those relationships wouldn't be broken? What could have happened? Couldn't forgiveness have come into that home so that the relationships wouldn't be broken? It doesn't mean you don't have to make decisions. Some people, you know, when I got, when, when you know, your son or your daughter does something crazy, it doesn't mean that you don't have to act and do something, maybe even strong, especially as they get older. Uh, but you don't have to do it without love in your heart, even if you have to make a tough decision. So then we'll close with, with this with this verse, that, and it's in it's in Ephesians four twenty three, and it's a it's a famous verse about forgiveness, and it gives the, the foundation. You know, one thing that a lot of people do when when someone dies. A lot of people suffer when someone dies because they think of what the relationship was with that person. The last thing they said, you know, maybe they never got to patch it up, they never got to say what they really thought, maybe there was something between them, and they, they come to the funeral or come to the, the memorial service feeling a little bit bad or maybe like, I don't even know if I should be here because my relationship wasn't so good with that person. You know, while we're still alive, Let's fix our relationships while we, while we still can, especially with brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's fix our relationships. That nothing is between us. Nothing, nothing, nothing is between us. It's clean. It's clean. When I look at you, nothing is between. And if you have a question, then you need to go. Is there something between us? Is there something between us? I feel like it's a little bit cold. And you can patch and heal relationships through the blood of Christ and through the forgiveness that we have through that blood. But here's the verse. In verse 31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Now you could say, Pastor Brian, why would you forgive David if he did something that was guilty, that he is guilty of? Why would you forgive him? And this verse says, you forgive him because God forgave him. That's why. Because really you don't have a choice. Right? His sin really has been taken away by God. And God's not going to treat him according to his sin. He's going to treat him according to the blood of Christ. So we forgive each other as God, for Christ's sake, forgave us. And we will find that there, is a, that there is a peace, a peace in our relationship. You know, I'm going back to, to Hetty, you know, she's completely, I mean, it's a huge bummer to lose this cello. Like, it's a huge bummer. Moment of silence. It's a huge bummer for her to lose the cello. And when something happens to us and we don't see the reason why it happens, we can have a problem with God and say, why did you do this to me? In a sense, in a sense we can say that God has sinned against me, right? That, that something bad happened to me that I don't feel like I deserve. But what do we do when that happens? 
What do we do when that happens? We have to go to God, go to Him, and He will show us His love. He will say to us, and we did a song uh, about, well, I will trust you. What is it? Um, Till uh, grace amazing, until I see you face to face and grace amazing takes me home, I'll trust you. Lord, I have no idea why it's happening, but I trust you. I trust you. No sin and no God. You didn't sin. You didn't sin. No, David didn't sin. No, I didn't. It has been forgiven. I trust you. I trust you for the whole situation. Let's pray. So, Father, thank you so much for this, this uh, message about forgiveness. Because more than anything else in the world, the most important thing to us is our relationships with people. With you, Father, first and foremost. With myself, that I would forgive myself. With other people, that I would forgive other people. And then that I would ask for forgiveness. Lord, may we experience the joy when forgiveness is given. When we ask for forgiveness and the person says, I forgive you, and the relationship is restored. Thank you, Father, for this gift that you've given to us called forgiveness. May we use it seven times no, seven times seventy. for this opportunity of grace for our relationships. Bless our week this week, we pray as we walk on this earth. And Lord, yes, our feet are going to get dirty. And we are who we are by your grace only. Remind us constantly that our sins have been forgiven. That is your glory to take away our sins and to conceal them. Not to talk about them. Conceal them. We thank you for it. Bless us as we go in Christ Jesus' name.